we're going to do a casual video today where we talk about some great classic books that you can read in a day. If you're in a reading slump and maybe you just want to feel like you've accomplished something, reading a short book is a great way to break out of it. But also, these are all just high quality books. They are all under 250 pages, though a lot of them are much shorter than 250 pages. They really are the kinds of books that most readers could read in a day, and if not in a day, then in a couple of days. The first book I wanna recommend is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. So I've only recently read Virginia Woolf, and I kind of decided to read her on accident. I am packing up all of our books. In fact, I'm gonna make a video about the fact that I've given away or sold probably about 70% of our books lately. We're planning on moving. We decided that this would be a great time to really declutter and minimize, including our book collection. And I noticed that we had a few books by Virginia Woolf on the shelf. We had them because they were books that my wife had read or wanted to read. And I decided to start reading some Woolf. One of the reasons I decided to pick up Woolf was because I realized that on this channel, I don't recommend women very often. And the reason I don't recommend a lot of women is because I actually don't read a lot of women. Even though some of my favorite writers are women, just proportionally, uh, it's a little skewed right now. And I decided I was gonna try and intentionally seek out some women to read. It turns out that reading A Room of One's Own is like the perfect book if you've been thinking about the fact that you don't read enough women, because it in fact is a sort of narrative essay or an essay with a narrative in it about the problem of women in fiction. Wolf is tasked to write something about women in fiction, and she ends up spending a lot of time even wondering, what would it mean to write something about women in fiction? I think she describes it as that both women and fiction are problems that have yet to be solved. I would recommend this basically to anybody. It's a great way to start reading a little bit more nonfiction if you're mostly a fiction reader, because it does have that kind of narrative thrust to it. It's elegant, it, there's wit there, that's that kind of wit that really is like true insight, that's very enjoyable to read, and certainly Reading this book has made me want to go and read more Wolf. So I made sure as I was packing my books to keep a copy of To the Lighthouse out so that I could read it. A second great classic book that you can read really quickly actually is Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. We say Lao Tzu, though I think there's some dispute over whether or not Lao Tzu was actually a historical figure. Now, I cannot explain this book very well to you. And, and the reason that I can't explain it very well is actually because I'm not quite sure what Taoism is. I say this actually out of respect and interest. I've been reading the Tao Te Ching uh, and all of it feels like it's kind of going over my head. It's like I can glimpse that there's something there. A lot of it is so alien to me though that I have a hard time making sense of it. And this just means that there's more work for me as a reader. I just need to spend more time thinking about this stuff. Funnily enough, my wife who is from China and is a fellow philosopher, uh, I asked her about the Tao Te Ching once, and she told me she didn't understand what was going on either. One of my favorite writers of all time, Ursula K. Le Guin, actually has like a, a translation of the Tao Te Ching, and you can see some influences of Taoism and Buddhism, I would say, in some of her books, some in The Dispossessed, definitely in the later Earthsea books, and it's made me think that I should, I should spend a little bit more time with the Tao Te Ching. I also just don't know a lot about non-Western philosophy, even though that's a very broad category. It's so broad it might almost be meaningless. It's another thing I've been trying to fix. So reading some Chinese philosophy and reading some Indian philosophy is how I've been um, starting that process to try to rectify that problem and just you know expand my reading horizons a little bit. This is a Penguin Classic edition, and that gives me a good opportunity to talk about translations and editions that you should buy of classic text. I get a question very, very often, which is like, what translation should I buy of X, where X is just some book that I've mentioned before. The problem is that a lot of the times when I'm asked that question, I actually don't know the original language, so I can't speak on the quality of translation. But let me give you a little tip on, on what you should do. Basically, you should trust good publishers. So for academic works, I always recommend Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, Chicago, Notre Dame. Usually the translations that they produce are going to be high quality. For non-academic publishers, there are two series that I especially recommend. One of them is the Penguin Classics, and the other is the Oxford World Classics. Another series you could look at, though it tends to be a bit more expensive, is the Norton Critical Editions. They'll often have a lot of like supplementary text to help you kind of understand what's going on. My preferred edition of Beowulf, for instance, is from a Norton Critical Edition. So if you're not sure what translation to buy of the Tao Te Ching or any classic text, look for Penguin, look for Oxford, look for Norton, especially if more than one of those publishers has published the same translation, that's a really good sign. There are a lot of books from the ancient Greek world on this list, so let's go through and talk about some of those. First up would be Sappho. This is published under the title Stung with Love. It's poems and fragments. Sappho is an ancient Greek poet, and 
We don't have many complete works from her. The majority of her writing, as with many ancient Greek writers, really just exist in fragments. However, some of these fragments are incredibly powerful. Let me just read a passage from Sappho to kind of illustrate some of the, the, the beauty in, in her words, even in translation. May gales in anguish sweep elsewhere, the killer of my character, but I am hardly some backbiter bent on vengeance. No, my heart is lenient. You were at hand, and I broke down raving, my craving a fire that singed my mind, a brand you quenched. Cold grew the spirits of the ladies, they drew their wings close to their bodies. I'm not the most sophisticated poetry reader, and so it's very difficult for me to give a critical analysis of a poem. It's just not the kind of reading that I'm used to doing, the kind of discussions that I'm used to having. But I can say that when I read Sappho, I at least, at the very least, I feel moved. I feel like I'm, I'm experiencing something real there and beautiful. You could read through this text very, very quickly. There are a lot of notes and commentary, as is pretty common with these Penguin classics. And because of that, uh, actually just reading the text of Sappho, you could do in an afternoon. The next recommendation from the Hellenistic world is Aesop's Fables, again, the Penguin Classic Edition. This is one of the thicker books on today's list. It is about 200 pages, but keep in mind that there is a lot of empty space and there's a lot of commentary. You could skip that if you just wanted to read the fables themselves. A lot of Aesop's Fables will be familiar to you in some form or another. For instance, we have the oldest version of the tortoise and the hare in this text. Now, whether or not Aesop collected them or wrote them, um, I think for each fable can be historically contested. It seems like a lot of things that were fables, I think just were attributed to Aesop just over the years. But what that means is that we kind of have a text that's been edited by history for us of important and interesting fables. They're often very short. You could break up the reading across multiple days or weeks and just read a few of the fables a day if you wanted, but you could also easily read this in a day. In addition to fables, by the way, about like animals like the tortoise and the hare, you also get short fables and stories about the Greek gods. If you're interested in Greek mythology, this really is a, a must read in my opinion. One more Greek text on the list would be Hesiod's Theogony. If you buy the Oxford World Classics Edition, which was translated by M.L. West, you will also get works and days. Theogony itself is actually only about 30 pages, so this is this is like an hour's reading. You, you could read this very, very quickly. And it's not the easiest read. It's not particularly breezy because it's not written in a very modern style, obviously. However, it's very compelling. I feel inspired by it. Uh, when I want to be inspired, I often find turning to the Greeks is just a great way to make me want to write. Even though few modern writers would write anything like Theogony in a work of fiction, I guess the closest we have might be like the Silmarillion, uh, a modern writer who wants to write about cosmology and uh, the origins of the divine and the, the origins of the world as the world is being made out of raw materials and the gods create their lineage and then how do the gods mingle with men. I mean, obviously Tolkien is drawing from mythology on purpose when he writes you know, those notes that became the Silmarillion, but you can go and read the original thing. You can go read it in Hesiod. This is the earliest form of a lot of those stories that make up what we now call Greek mythology. So historically, it's a very interesting read, but also it's just a compelling narrative. Moving from the Hellenistic world and then going into the Roman world, we should talk about this little book by Masonius Rufus called That One Should Disdain Hardships. Gaius Masonius Rufus was a Roman Stoic. He was a teacher of Epictetus, who's a very famous Stoic. We've talked about him a lot on this channel. And Masonius Rufus's little book here is actually the first book I would recommend if you want to start reading the original sources of Stoicism. I say this because it's very short. Each of the chapters is very digestible, and then the final bits, which are all fragments, you could breeze through even though there is a lot to chew on. Just because a book is short does not mean that it doesn't teach us something very important. One of the things I was trying to do when I made this list was to pick books that we could actually really truly learn from or be inspired by. Reading this book, it was like some of the things that I knew I loved about the Stoics crystallized, they became a little bit clearer for me. And that's kind of why I recommend it as an introduction, but it's also a book that I'm just going to return to many times in my life. This is printed by Yale University Press. That's another publisher you can usually trust. And this is the translation by Cora E. Lutz. From what I can gather, the Cora E. Lutz translation really is seen as the definitive, authoritative, high quality translation of Masonius Rufus. There are others out there. I can't comment on the quality of all of them, but I feel very good about recommending the Cora E. Lutz translation. For a very light read, 
uh, one that's easy to read in a day and also just very enjoyable for both for kids and adults. I have Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. The edition here doesn't really matter because he wrote he wrote in English, so as long as you can get a high quality printing of the English text, you're doing just fine. Obviously, many of us know about Alice in Wonderland because of the very successful Disney movie, but the book itself deserves to be read. You know, I've been reading a lot of kids books lately because my wife and I had a son a few months ago, and even when you're reading the earliest kids books, you quickly learn that not all kids books are created equal. There are some which are high quality works of art, like real literary works that are also enjoyable for adults to read. And then there are all the others. Finding those high quality and enjoyable children's books are very important to me now because I'm going to be doing more reading to my son as he grows older and older. And I, and I know that Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a book that he'll enjoy one day, but it's also a book that I'll enjoy when I'm reading it to him. You know, kids love it because it's fantastical, it's whimsical, it's funny. Adults can really appreciate more of the wordplay, the kind of playful nonsense or the sense of the illogical that Lewis Carroll brings. You know, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician, he was a logician, he was he was a really brilliant mind. And so he, because he understands the logical so well, he's sort of able to play with the illogical and the paradoxical very well in his text. Finally, my last recommendation for today is Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. This book is a classic. Um, the author won a Nobel Prize. I feel like if you're looking for those kind of institutional accolades to let you know that something is high quality, Siddhartha has it all. Um, I also love that I, I have been looking at copies of Siddhartha for a long time in my life. The first time I've, I bought this book and picked it up was in high school. And I think basically this edition with this cover has just been continuously sold for at least 15 years, but it looks like it's a lot older than that. You know, one of the great human problems is to think about suffering and to think about how we're going to endure suffering. One of the reasons that I recommend the Stoics so often to people is that they teach you not how to become indifferent to suffering, but how to endure the suffering that you will inevitably experience. And I think that Siddhartha is a great exploration of human suffering, human despair, and moving past it into something, into something greater. One of the reasons that we read good fiction is because it gives us a model that we can implement in our own lives. And so reading Siddhartha Maybe for someone who's thinking about suffering, you're thinking about despair, maybe you are suffering yourself or in despair, reading Siddhartha, maybe it's the right time for you to pick up Siddhartha. Pick it up today, you could finish it by this evening, and I don't know, maybe it's one of those books that's going to have a big impact. You never know which of the books that we pick up are going to be the ones that really shape how we think going forward, but maybe Siddhartha or another book on this list could be that book for you.